While Mars's atmosphere, once as thick as if not thicker than Earth's today, is now leaking into space. Brad Tucker is an astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU and he joins me now live. Brad, great to see you as always. OK, so what does this mean exactly and, and what's causing it? Yeah, so this is kind of interesting. So the sun definitely gets an eruption. So we get something also regularly called the solar wind. This is kind of what you may think about a, a wind. This is a natural energy release from the sun uh, that travels through space. And this hits the Earth all the time. And luckily, we're relatively protected. Now, Mars, though, even though Mars is further away, has a much weaker magnetic field, which is kind of this protective bubble. And so it often is pushing on the atmosphere of Mars, kind of like, you know, if you get a gust and it kind of blows you around on a day. Well, for about two days, the wind stopped reaching Mars. Uh, and the MAVEN instrument, which is in, in orbit around Mars, when this happened, showed that when the wind stopped, the atmosphere of Mars on the daytime side, the side facing Mars, swelled up dramatically. And when I say dramatically, it went from about a normal 800 kilometers to a couple of thousand kilometers in terms of size. So a really massive swelling up. So, you know, you can think about it this way, where, again, if it's a really gusty day and maybe it's rainy and, and windy and you have your umbrella out and the umbrella is being pushed to the side and all of a sudden the wind stops, well, it kind of corrects itself. And, and this is a big thing because we've always wondered why Mars's atmosphere naturally is so much thinner and smaller when we think it was about the same size or similar at least to Earth billions of years ago. And so it's kind of is that strong evidence of just how sh big the impact the wind from the sun does have on the Mars atmosphere and, and why it may be as weak as it is today. Is this rare for something like this to happen? Does it happen to other planets as well? Well, so so we do know these storms happen and we do know the effects of them are, are relatively minor, again, because they mostly have magnetic fields that protects them. Mercury doesn't really have an atmosphere, so it's kind of irrelevant. And then Jupiter and Saturn and the rest of the planets are so far away that it doesn't really matter. So Mars is kind of in that weird spot where close enough so the winds do impact it, but not strong enough to protect itself. Uh, and because you usually always have this wind, you know, you may not have the big gusts on Earth, but we always have a little bit of wind. Again, that's the same with space. Because there was this unique couple of days that it swelled was an interesting study. Now, this has actually happened to Earth as well in the past, uh, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and the early uh, days of satellite observations on the Earth. Um, there was a few days that this happened where the wind stopped and our atmosphere swelled as well. So we do think it's a common phenomenon, um, but one we just really have never been able to measure in the great detail uh, that the MAVEN instrument did on Mars. Yeah, OK, interesting. Uh, let's move on now. The James Webb Telescope, it's been looking at a star cluster. What has it discovered? So yeah, star clusters are, are really the the beginnings of stars, it's the, the stellar nurseries where the gas is collect, condensed down to form baby stars. But when it was studying this, one of the things it wanted to focus on is a type of object called brown dwarf. So the stars you're seeing on your screen now are usually in particular very big stars, sometimes and often bigger than our sun. But occasionally, and what, this is what was found in this area, were a few brown dwarfs. And brown dwarfs are, are quite mysterious because they condense down under gravity uh, like stars do, but they never get hot enough and dense enough to turn that gas uh, into energy and turn it on into a star. So they kind of almost fail as planets, but yet they can be, they're obviously bigger than planets, but in a few of these cases, some of them are only three to four times the size of Jupiter. So it's really kind of an object that straddles the border between is it a planet and is it a star and what determines do you turn into a planet or what determines do you turn into a star? <laughs> so studying this in detail was really important to kind of see these, these small objects that are hard to detect, but really mysterious in determining and, and telling us a lot about how those stars and planets come together. Yeah, interesting. Now, China has launched its experimental reusable spacecraft. This is the third time uh, it's done it, Brad. So uh, what exactly do we know about this particular launch? Yeah, and, and it kind of goes off the back of the U.S. preparing for their X-37B launch. It was scheduled for last week, and it's been slightly delayed. And, and the X-37B, just like this Chinese plane, 
um, are, are pretty much space drones. They're about the size of each other. They, they're about eight metric tons, about uh, maybe about a quarter of the size the U.S. space shuttle used to be. Uh, and they're autonomous. So they go up there. There's no one piloting it. They fly. And then they come back down and land as an airplane. Now, there's a lot of secrecy around both programs, the Chinese and U.S. program. Most are, are clearly that they serve some sort of military function. Uh, it is believed that they're either testing new satellites or equipment, uh, using it as a new way of prototyping uh, technologies in space, uh, and obviously being used for military spy purposes. The last launch, the second launch, it was able to stay in orbit for 276 days, so just around seven months or so. So it'll be interesting to see how long this one stays in orbit. The first launch was only a few days, and then it was about seven months, so we'll see how long this one stays up there. Uh, the U.S.'s version has been able to stay in orbit for at least four years, so these are very useful um, ways of getting things into space, maybe for very clear or short purposes, either for testing or operational use. Yeah, OK. It just seems like every country uh, are doing their bit in this uh, ever-fascinating <laughs> space race, that's for sure, Brad. Now, just finally, the sun has unleashed what's being described as a monster solar flare, and it's the most powerful since 2017. Yeah, this is what we call an X2.8 flare. So uh, the sun goes through periods of eruptions, and uh, the sun has a, a, an activity cycle of 11 years where you get more or less of them, and we're in this very massive period of more. Now, solar flares come in sizes. The, the B and C ones are fairly weak. M's the middle in terms of energy, and X are the most powerful. And there's even a scale of that X1, X2, 3, and so on. So the bigger the letter and the bigger the, the number, the more energy that is released. And as you said, the biggest one in about six or so years. Now, when these flares erupt, um, occasionally they hit the Earth. Now, when they hit the Earth, they often produce the aurora that we see, which is fantastic to go out and look at. Big enough ones can actually cause interference and disruptions to networks on Earth. So they can create simple things like interference with high-frequency bandwidths. Uh, bigger storms can interfere with satellites, and even larger storms can impact electrical systems here on Earth. So it's a really important part of what we do in space and a lot of studying the sun, and that is measuring the activity of the sun and the solar weather, because that will have a big impact on Earth, because a big enough storm can cause such large disruptions to electrical systems, and our modern day is based on electrical systems that could really cause a havoc. So uh, the storm, uh, which happened on the 14th, if it does hit, obviously it weakens as it hits the Earth, uh, it travels through space, before it hits the Earth, um, would potentially hit here on the 17th or so. How much of it or how big of an impact, we're not quite sure. Um, but so far, it shouldn't be too large of a one, but a reminder but of why we study these things and that larger ones could happen in the future. So you're talking the 17th of December, tomorrow? That's right. Something okay. to, to keep an eye out for. Uh, also, if you like to watch Aurora, Tomorrow night may be a great chance to go out and spot the aurora in the southern part of the country. All right, there you go. Any sky gazers who want to just have a look up into the sky tomorrow? That's Brad's tip. We appreciate it, Brad. <laughs> Always good to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks.